So my concept of perception attack is meant to approach uh, the question of preemptive war from a certain angle. The concept of preemption realigns the theory and practice of war on time, and it does it in a way that reproblematizes perception and obviously because it has to do with time, memory. So what I'd like to do is um, uh, just create a little bit of a context for thinking through of how that might play out. We remember what we do not see. This is how Governor George Pataki of New York, pious before unseen towers, inaugurated the 2004 Republican Party convention that was to carry George W. Bush to a second term in office, riding the surf of 9-11 in the war on terror one last time before the swell subsided. Standing in the ebb, far from ground zero, two and a half years later, a reminder may be in order that the swell at the time was more like a tidal wave. It burst levees, eroded embankments, and laid down sediment, leaving the political landforms over which it swept reshaped. The governor's dictum might capture something more of the altered landscape than it might first appear from its offering as a rhetorical flourish. It locates the flourishing of the political between memory and perception. This would be familiar ground where the relation between the two is presented, were the relation between the two presented as one of continuity. Pataki, however, syncopates them. They both still occur, but not on beat. Perception and memory fall out of step. What we're aware of in the present falls out of step with what is retained from the past as still having the power to affect. This disallows an ordered correlation or step-by-step -step progression between memory and perception. This, in turn, takes the ground out from under the notion of representation as applied to politics. It also makes a directly political issue of time by reopening the question of how the present's relation to the past, or for that matter, the present's relation to itself, is politically operationalized. Soren Kierkegaard distinguished two regimes of memory. What is recollected has been, he said, is repeated backward, whereas repetition is recollected forward. Whereas memory, as normally understood, is a recollection of what has been, repetition is a recollection of what has not yet come, a memory of the future. This is not so hard to grasp if we think of repetition as self-contracting on the model of habit. We say we have a habit, but we all know that it's really the habit that has gotten hold of us. It is an automatism that inhabits us. It is of its nature as an automatism to pass under the radar of awareness. We are only ever aware of an habitual action having occurred. What we consciously perceive are its next effects. Otherwise, we would catch it in the act and decide to execute the action or not, in which case it will not have acted as a habit. A habit is self-deciding. It is a self-effecting force from the past that acts in the present, which appears only in a next effect. The present of this force's actual operation is elided. This is a kind of syncopation of time itself, where the skipped beat is the operative present, the present of the operation. This active present is expressed only in the nextness which comes of it. It actively disappears into its forward expression. We normally think of habit as bare repetition, and of repetition as barren by nature. But for Kierkegaard, as for Nietzsche and Deleuze, repetition is a positive force, carrying the past forward into a next expression. It is a positively organizing, even creative force of time. This implies that it may be captured and put to use. 
the elision of the operative moment may be operationalized. The United States Defense Advanced Research Agency, or DARPA, knows this. It is an off step or two ahead of Governor Pataki. Like him, it knows that we habitually remember what we do not see. It also knows, like him, that this is a political time issue critical to the so-called war on terror. But it goes further to the philosophical realization that there is a positive power to rep repetition, which means that it is not barren and even so humdrums a species of it as habit partakes of the creative force of time. We need only think of attention. Attention is the base state habit of perception. Every awareness begins in a shift. We think of ourselves as directing the shifts in our attention, but if you pay attention to paying attention, you quickly sense that rather than you directing your attention, your, di your attention is directing you. It pulls you into your coming perception, which dawns on you as attention's next effect. Attention is a perceptual automatism that consists in tagging a change in the perceptual field as new and potentially important and building awareness on that change for the very good reason that it may signal a necessity of a response or an opportunity for action. The next perception into which you are pulled is already a convocation to action and reaction. According to contemporary perception studies, this happens in the elided present of a repetition in a confirmation of attention's habitual nature. DARPA is preoccupied with the possibility of operationalizing the elided present of attention. Their interest is to be seen against the backdrop of the realignment of military doctrine over the last 15 years on what is called full spectrum force. This is the extension of military affairs to, quote, gray areas involving non-traditional operations other than war, OOTW, in the words of Ullman and Wade the authors of the famous book, Shock and Awe, one of the classic statements of the doctrine of full spectrum force. This expansion in the purview of military operation is a response to the blurring of boundaries characterizing contemporary war, in which the archetype of the enemy is no longer the uniformed soldier, but the terrorist, the assumed organization of the adversary as another contemporary classic of war theory drives home, Arkila and Ronfeld's Network, networks and net wars, is then no longer the identifiable regular army and its centralized state scaffolding, but the diffuseness of the network. The network is recessive. It melts into the population. Arkila and Ronfeld call it unbounded and expanding. It is pervasive. It insinuates itself across the technological and communica communicational nerve paths of society. The attacks it enables erupt without warning. They rise up from within an unbounded field rather than striking out in a determinable direction from a locatable base. Net war's infiltrating reach is potentially coextensive with social and cultural space. This irrevocably blurs the boundaries between the civil and military spheres. Other boundaries blur as a consequence. For example, between offense and defense. When the civil is no longer clearly demarcated from the military nor offense from defense, it becomes impossible to say where the exercise of force begins and ends. Military affairs bleed across the spectrum. They span a continuum stretched between two poles or extremes. One end lies, at one end lies the traditional application of force on force, again in Ullman and Wade's words. This is the pole of traditional engagement on the model of the battle, siege, or occupation. At the other pole lies what they call soft power. As a first approximation, soft power can be understood as the military use of information and disinformation and of psyops, or what used to be called psychological warfare. Arkila and Ronfeldt characterize soft power as epistemological warfare because its business is what people know or think they know. 
Of course, epistemological warfare is nothing new, as the last presentation showed. But the paradigm has significantly shifted. Traditionally, what is now called soft power was a helper to hard power. It was secondary to force on force, whose effectiveness it was meant to boost. It was an additive like leavening. Now, on the other hand, according to Arkila and Ronfeld, all conflict is by nature epistemological. Soft power, rather than an additive or booster, is a baseline state. This is a necessary consequence of the full spectrum situation, where it's no longer punctual, like a battle. It is on low boil all the time. It is no longer localized, like an occupation. The heat is everywhere. The definition of action underpinning, un, un, underpinning the force on force of hard power is fundamentally that of friction, matter on matter, metal on metal, projectile against shielding, metal in flesh, flesh splayed, splashed on hard surfaces, force of attack against opposing force of resistance. The overall aim of this force against force is attrition. It meets the enemy head on and wears down his capabilities across an extensive series of frictional engagements. Its aims and means are painfully tangible. In the current field of conflict, this kind of punctual engagement has lost its centrality. It has been replaced by waiting. Being in a thick of war has been watered down and drawn out into an endless waiting, both sides poised for action. The baseline state is now the always-on of low-boiled, poising for action, when is always in the thin of it. When a strike of force against force does come, it stands out against the background continuity of this thin condition, which Paul Virilio presciently called the non-battle, years before it became the obsessive concern of leaders, both military and civilian. When it comes, the eruption, eruption of action is an ebullition, a momentary boiling over in this low-intensity broth of the always-on conflict of the non-battle. Soft power is how you act militarily in waiting when you're not yet tangibly acting. It is a way of preventing the weight itself from being an attrition, or even a way of turning it to advantage. In the condition of non-battle, when you have nothing on which to act tangibly, there's still one thing you can do. Act on that very condition. Act to change the conditions in which you wait. After all, it is from these same conditions that any action to come will have emerged. By acting on the wait time conditions in the intervals between boilings over, you may well be able to reduce the potential of an eventual attack, moderate its powers of attrition if it comes, or even better, induce it to take tangible shape when and where you are ready for it. That way you have a chance of disabling it before it reaches its full magnitude, or even in the case where it bursts forth at full strength, you can be reasonably confident that you'll be able to respond to it with rapid and overwhelming force. Thus you take as your military field of operation the environmental conditions in which both combatants and the non-combatant population lives, what Ullman and Wade call the total situation. The only way to act on the total situation is to act on the conditions of emergence of the battle prior to its occurrence. These conditions concern threats which in the parlance of the doctrine of preemption are not yet fully formed. What is not yet fully formed is still in potential. It may already be on the horizon, brewing like a recipe for disaster, or ominously looming like an unclear, almost present threat. It carries an irreducible degree of an indeterminacy. The measure of indeterminacy makes it as intangible as it is ominous. It's a tall order. You must act totally on the intangibles of the situation. The ultimate boundary blurred is that between the tangible and the intangible, the corporeal and the incorporeal, because to act on the former, you have to act on the latter. There are two ways to act totally and intangibly on a situation. The first is by transposing your action from the spatial axis of battle, siege, or occupation onto a time axis. You operate in and on the interval 
in which what is not yet fully formed is already imperceptibly brewing. You can act on that almost present in order to influence the active form of its next awaited emergence. Preemption is proaction, action on the conditions of action prior to its actually taking shape. The second way to act totally and intangibly on a situation is to act on perception. It is perception which prepares a body for action and reaction. By modulating perception, you can already modulate subsequent action, reaction. This, in fact, makes perception a kind of royal road to the almost present. The two ways of acting intangibly with a view to the total situation converge. It was perception's powers of proaction that motivated Arkila and Ronfeldt's characterization of contemporary war as epistemological. But it is a mistake to take too cognitive an approach. The move into perception is accompanied in the contemporary theory of war with a correlative move toward what is called the capabilities-centered approach, which was advanced by Donald Rumsfeld and his fellow neoconservatives. In this approach, you move into perception in order to operate not at the level at which actions are decided, but at the level at which the very capacity for action is forming. Operating on the level at which decisions are made focuses on the properly cognitive aspect of knowledge. It's informational contents, their availability, reliability, and manipulability their actual usability. Operating, on the other hand, on the level at which the capacity for action is in the making is a very different proposition. It focuses on a pre-decision process occurring in an interval of emergence antecedent to both informed knowing and deliberative action. This is a point before knowability and actability have differentiated from one another. At that point, a modulation of perception is directly and immediately a change in the parameters of what a body can do, both in terms of how it can act and what it will know. This antecedent level of capacitation or potentialization is proto-epistemological and already ontological in that it concerns changes in the body's degree and mode of enablement in and toward its total situation or life environment. Any application of force at this level is an onto power, a power through which being becomes. An onto power is not a force against life, as any force against force must inevitably be at its point of application. Rather, it is a positive force. It is positively productive of the particular form a life will take next. It conditions life's nextness. It is a force of life. Allman and Wade are unambiguous about the fact that operating on this level is indeed an exercise of force, even though its object is intangible. It is not a lesser force, even though it is exerted in the thinness of the non-battle. It is, they say, more than an application of force. It's a surplus of force. It exceeds the parameters of tangible applications of battle force and of the known contents of life upon which those applications bear and to which they add a hard permutation through their action of attrition. The productive force of non-battle returns to the level of conditioning at which the parameters for attritional force have been set. There is always a follow-up action-reaction to an exercise of force against force. There is a second next enveloped in the next, and a third in that. What is conditioned is a forward series of potential repetitions. It is this excess over the next one that makes non-battle force a surplus of force, or a surplus value of force. Its relation to force against force is analogous to the relation discovered by Marx between money as a means of payment, and money as capital. Capital is the driving force of the series of payment exchanges, money in the making, money beyond money. At each payment, a punctual return is made to capital. Profit is fed back into investment, replenishing the forward driving force of capital. Money loops from its punctual exercise as a means of payment into a feeding of the conditions of its own continuing. 
This excess of forward driving force over any given payment exchange engagement is surplus value as distinguished from profit. Surplus value is not the amount fed back. That's the profit. Surplus value is different from profit. It's not quantitative. It is processual. It is the processual quality from which quantities of money are generated in forward driving fashion. It is the ever nextness of proliferating quantities of economic value. Surplus value is realized punctually in the explicit act of exchange in such a way as to cyclically exceed any such exchange, value beyond value, immeasurably on the make. Like capital, non-battle force is at the same time forward driving and cyclic. At each frictional engagement, it feeds back into itself toward the conditioning of what will come next. It is the ever nextness of actual military value is realized punctually in explicit acts of war. Force beyond force, intangibly on the make. The force beyond force is the processual quality of conflict from which tangible military outcomes are generated. Allman and Wade do not hesitate to link the force beyond force as processual quality of war to time. This is not, they say, a force to overcome resistance. Rather, it is a force to own time, in their words. Recent military thinking has revolved around the concept of rapid dominance. Rapid, they say, means the ability to move quickly before an adversary can react. This force to own time operates in an interval smaller than the smallest perceivable. The target is perception, they say, always and at every band along the full spectrum. Even in the thick of things, when conflict boils over and force against force is to be engaged, the force to own time must still operate. It must squeeze into an interval smaller than the smallest perceivable between actions, so as to condition the enemy's reaction. This is the shock of shock and awe. The exercise of force against force is thus qualitatively different from the force to own time. But if its exercise is separated from the force to own time, then it rapidly loses its effectiveness. The force to own time is infra-level force. It is infra-active because it occurs in a smaller than smallest interval between actions. It is infra-perceptual because this same interval is also smaller than the smallest perceivable. And it is infra-temporal because being imperceptible, the interval of its exercise is an offbeat of time a mist step in the cadence of actions and re reactions in the lighted present between one moment and the next. In the thin of things, at the non-battle end of the spectrum, the force to own time still operates to infra-condition action by, quote, controlling the enemy's perception in the interests of the total situation, of, of total situation control. In the absence of dramatic action, spiking punctually from the baseline of the non-battle, the conditioning of the environment by the forced own time appears as continuous. But this is only so because we are not paying attention to paying attention. The offbeat is still there. The baseline habit of perception has not ceased contracting itself in us. It still inhabits us. The pull of attention has not ceased to take hold of us. It still directs us to a next perception and through it to a next action reaction. The baseline of war has accordioned into the baseline of perception. At the infra level, where the two baselines converge, war at the macro scale of battle, siege, and occupation falls into absolute processual proximity with war at the micro scale of everyday civilian life. It is no wonder that DARPA, for one, is paying intense attention to attention, all the more so since the infra interval is where perception itself is an absolute processual proximity with the body. The automatism that attention possesses by virtue of its sharing in nature with habit means that its operation rejoins the reflex workings of body matter. It is our bodies which contract habits. The operation of attention occurs at a point of indistinction between emergent perceptual experience and the mechanism of the brain and nervous system. To a certain degree, you can bypass the shielding or immunizing effects of preoperative cultural conditioning as well, as well as of personal histories, dispositions, and allegiances, by plugging into the nervous system and approaching attention from that automatic, 
autonomic angle. It is possible to find tangible handles to leverage the intangible dimensions of life of the body. It is possible within limits to machine experience. The limits are due to the fact that the system of perception, like capital, essentially involves feedback and is thus, like an economy, nonlinear. By definition, in a nonlinear system, you cannot linearly determine an outcome from a given punctual input. You do not cause an effect in that way. You effect a modulation instead. You create resonance or interference effects at the emergent level. These effects either self-amplify into a new systemic permutation, a positive modulation in actual operating parameters, or they jam, crash, overload the processual feed forwards which condition such positive modulations. In that case, what is affected is a suspension of actual operations at a point of emergence. The suspension amounts to an extension of the generative infra level. When perception and action re-engage, it is certain that something will have changed imperceptibly and in the abnormally extended interval. Thus, you can either work through the elided present to induce a positive modulation of experience, or you can work on it to extend the offbeat of experience and still end up modulating. Either way, you're exercising a positive power. You're either generating a modulation or extending the interval of generation acting differently to different effect. In a way, you're extracting a surplus value of perception out of the body's uh, systemic organization. Um, in the project that I had in mind by the um, by DARPA, the Defense Advanced um, Research Agency, uh, has to do with, trying, with finding ways of plugging into that moment, realizing that every perception is a repetition of itself, that there's always a non-conscious awareness followed a second or two seconds later by the possibility of a conscious awareness where deliberation and linguistic man manipulation uh, can actively occur. And what they found is that at the non-conscious level, many surprisingly uh, complex, higher level functions are already occurring. And you can identify the point at which it sets in by following the activity of the brain. So they've invented a way of, connect, of identifying those points, for example, when there is a moment of recognition, for example, of a face, um, and connecting that to machinery through uh, uh, EEGs. And they're creating these machines that incorporate the human body and nervous system into a kind of surveillance machinery where thousands of images can be, can be uh, uh, passed before someone 10 times faster than can be consciously recognized. And there's always a spike of recognition when what's being looked for comes up. And that can be captured by the machines. And they found that that recognition on the non-conscious level is 90% accurate, far more accurate than if they allow time for reflection. So something's happening between this non-conscious awareness and the ability to manipulate consciously. And what's happening is an insertion into other levels of organization, linguistics, symbolic, personal histories come back, personal uh, considerations um, that have to do with the, the situation and where that particular person wants to take it. And all the complexity of that integration of all those levels is such that what comes out is always an a fabulation. It's always in some, a, a fictional revision or elaboration upon the non-conscious awareness. So there's a kind of opening, a window of opportunity for taking a surplus value out of the operations of perception in a way that, that profits from this lag. Uh, one of the questions that, and I, and I think in a lot of ways, the economy through 
the, the, the use of imagery and the dominance of imagery through the mass media, through the, through the internet, and uh, practices of advertising are also sort of plumbing that interval in both its positive and its suspensive modes. But one of the interesting things is that in that moment of non-conscious awareness, which is thought of as happening in primitive regions of the brain, there are already extremely high level functions taking place like form discrimination, identification of new features, and it's also task oriented. Um, and according, so, so it has to do with the insertion of the entire being of the body in a very complex social situation where there are expectations and desires already in play, but somehow all of that's already in play at that non-conscious level. And according to studies in perception, for example, uh, studies by a researcher named Alva Noe and someone named John O'Reilly, there is no way that what is happening non-consciously, even though you can identify it with the spike in brain activity, that that brain activity is enough to account for the complexity of it. So they say that there's something incorporeal happening at a level even before the spike where the situation is being set up and the body is being oriented to a situation, to all of the tendencies within it, to the possible outcomes within it, and it's a very complex existential posture that prepares the possibility for both the non-conscious awareness and the conscious elaborations. And at that level, it's another level that can be accessed through what they call priming. For example, they have found that there is unconscious word recognition at that level, which then modulates what can be thought later. There is experiments shown when Bush was at the height of his popularity, when he was 70, there are 70 percent of the people in the United States in favor of him and his personal uh, uh, popularity was at its height. And they showed people, they just flashed pictures of, of George Bush's face in front of them and then tested to measure for anger level. And the anger level increased statistically, in a statistically significant way after looking at George Bush, even though they were well-intentioned toward him. And it's like that priming of, of George Bush's face, that, that faciality at the, at, the, at the head of, the, uh, of this war and terror, implanted people in an existential posture that included an extremely complex positioning toward certain possible outcomes, certain tendencies within the situation, which then creatively, productively modulated what they thought afterwards. The same thing happens with images of money, which makes people afterwards take, at an unconscious level, take a much greater physical distance on one another and to be much less generous toward, toward one another. So what, what, uh, what I'm interested in is looking at all of these effects, but not looking at them as simply as uh, subliminal influence, but as real existential operations which are creating uh, fields, pragmatic fields of potential action and thought that modulate without directly causing what might come out, and that there are many, many ways and levels within even those micro scales of what happens between the onset of an event and a conscious uh, awareness of it uh, that can be taken advantage of, used in various ways, and that if it's only the military and the right who find ways of uh, intervening at that level, then their opposition will always be at a disadvantage. So the suggestion that I'm trying to make is that there are perhaps ways that are, rather than manipulative, creatively opening that also operationalizes that level and approaches these practices at their own level, but to very, very different effect. Thank you.